at least not in the way you think I am, and I did not die for your sins. But I did fall for your only sin, which is the sin of unconsciousness. And it has been a difficult journey since my fall upon the cross. Let me take you through the whole experience of the crucifixion, all the way up to that point when I cried out to God, Why hast thou forsaken me? Prior to that moment, I was not in distress. Even though I'd been brutalized, and even though I was in great pain, I was connected to God. I could feel God's presence and God's love, and it sustained me. I was in oneness with God. I was in a state of trust and surrender to the will of God. But then everything changed. I looked out into the crowd, and I saw despair. My mother was there. She was weeping. Magdalene was there with some of my closest disciples. They were all weeping, and somehow it caught me. I got involved in their despair, and at that point, I fell. It was a fall in consciousness. Suddenly, the light of God began to fade. I could feel the presence of God leaving me. The physical pain flooded in. I was overwhelmed with despair and confusion. What had I done wrong? Had I failed God in some way? Had I loved these people too much? Had I told them more than I should have? Had I misled them in some way? All these questions arose in an instant. I looked out, and all I could see was despair. I looked down, and unimaginable terror arose within me, for the very earth seemed to open up beneath me. Human unconsciousness, like a thousand snakes in a bottomless pit, rose up to swallow me. I was about to fall into eternal darkness. I was filled with the suffering of an unconscious humanity. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I cried. And then I died. Well, I hadn't previewed the next section. Nothing, nothing like something light for breakfast, like the crucifixion. <laughs> uh, I wasn't uh, expecting that. But anyway, it takes us right into the, the heart of the matter, so to speak. And, you know, he, he describes, well, maybe I should just open this up and ask you guys, what, what do you think the main message of this section was? So you can unmute yourself um, and go ahead and share. Or what, what struck you from this? I, it, it, just, it just hit me right off. Oh my God, what an amazing description of what we're going through right now. I right. <laughs> and that was a real shock. <laughs> it's like, wow, we're going... The, the world, the human consciousness is going through a crucifixion right now. And, and then the content of it sort of came in next. It, it's that it's, it's doubt and um, the loss of trust. You know, we don't trust our police. We don't trust people to do that. We don't trust Congress to do this. We don't trust Trump to do anything about testing. We don't trust, you know, and what a nightmare that is. Because it's like, and that image of the ground, uh, you know, dissolved, you know, I thought that was a reference to the earthquake, but it's something much more than that. It's like this whole foundation that we've created of this is the way things are supposed to be is gone. 
and and there's no ground under us. You know, it's sort of like the the previous week of the whole discussion about uh, beliefs, and you know, when you take away the beliefs, then all you have is the present moment, and that requires a hell of a lot of trust to just. You know, not know what the future is going to be or, you know, what the next breath is going to do or whatever. <laughs> anyway, it was just, wow, it was, that was amazing. Thank you, Richard. How, how, how obvious, how direct it was, you know, <laughs> like, I don't have to think about <laughs> what I got from that section. <laughs> okay. Anyone else want to chime in? I think, um, I can. I, I think so. that it reminded me um, when he's talking about he looked down and he was sucked into the despair of the people there. So that reminded me of what you talked about on Sunday about how you may see the despair. It isn't that you don't say it's not there, but you keep yourself in the higher mind. So that's that's what I was thinking about. And I totally got what Richard was saying too. It's definitely, we're being taken through a, it's like dropping out. Everything is dropped away mm -hmm. that we rely on really. So, except the true thing that we can rely on. Right. Yeah. yeah um and I don't like using this word because it gets messed up, but that the ground <clears throat> that we think we're standing on is an illusion. Like it is not as solid, whether it's the financial yeah. system or the government or the police or, you know, healthcare, all of those things are not solid. It's, it's not where we find our salvation, if you will. But we have built all these things up to be a substitute where we can feel safe and secure. And then all of it is sort of falling away beneath our feet over the last couple of months. And to your point, Patricia, it's kind of like uh, the story, you know, that if, if you find someone, you know, in quicksand, you don't step into the quicksand to help them out because now you're both in the quicksand. You, you have got to remain on firm ground to continue the, um, the metaphor. And so, you know, this, this ties in very much actually with Genesis, because um, if you think about the story of Genesis, the garden is a story about consciousness. And it's a consciousness of oneness and of love. And as long as they were in a sense of connection with the divine. They felt one, they felt love, everything was wonderful in the garden. So when we talk about the fall, which again was not um, an idea that the Jewish people talked about, they, they did not have, have this idea like we do about the fall from grace and all of that. But you know, another way of talking about a fall from grace is the fall from consciousness that if you're connected, if you're feeling the presence of God, and if you're feeling that love, then you're in the garden and you're, you're, you're fine. It's when you lose the connection, that's when you get kicked out of the garden and you drop to unconsciousness. And he, you know, he talked about that, that he got sucked into human unconsciousness. Any any uh, any other things that struck you? There you go. <laughs> I'm trying. To, okay, so after the wonderful comments from Richard and Patricia, I feel embarrassed to even say this. So, but I will because <laughs> it's rather mundane. Um, it seems to me he said that he got lost in the despair and it's taken him all this time to make his way back. Did I get that right or did I, did I misunderstand him? 
because I was, that, that, was, that was really shocking to me. And not like I think about Jesus at all. I always think of Jesus as always present, has always been present through the generations. But maybe there was a part of his soul that has been having many lives. I think at some point in the presentation, he talks about his many lives. <coughs> and that, I, that's how he was making his way back. But maybe I misunderstood. I, th I thought he was talking about from a state of oneness that because he said he's I, right before that, I think he said something about um, our holding on to beliefs has kept him on the cross. Yes. yes. And maybe it's in the next section from when we yeah. listened yeah. to it before, but somewhere in there, there's a thing about, oh, my God, I've been hanging on this cross for 2000 right. years because of you all. Yeah. And, that before. Right. And so I think it's that. It, it, where uh, look, I, I would have to look at it from the point of view that there's only one consciousness and we're all contributing to it. Yes. And that that is what has taken the 2000 years just to, to come around, which right. again really plays into what we're talking about right now, that there's this amazing awakening that we're, you know, it's not just black people protesting anymore. It's everybody gets it, and it's not even Americans. I mean, people in Europe or uh, around the world are getting what's going on here because we've all had a part of creating that consciousness yes. of inequality. And as we and, all clear our own consciousness, we're clearing everybody. So, yeah. Yeah, and so we're all, so back to the, and this is what I was saying about the crucifixion, realizing this is a crucifixion moment, we're all hanging on this cross of our beliefs and our, and our rigidities and stuff. And that is like, I've, you know, when we've been, all the times that we've gone through, that I've gone through Way of Mastery and he's talked about the crucifixion, I have honestly never understood what he's talking about. <laughs> never quite get it. And this section, I think I got it. It's like, oh, there's, I'm holding on for dear life to these ideas, and I'm right. This has got to be the way it is, <laughs> and it's creating all this pain and separation for all of us, yeah. uh, separation out of the state of oneness and separation out of um, um, uh, we're all part of the same thing, and we're all in separation from the present moment, uh, you know. <laughs> All of that is what's got us ah, hanging on. We're literally hanging on to the beliefs. Anyway, I, it was just a <laughs> mind-boggling realization. <laughs> Marion, morning. Um, hi. You know, I had a sense when the George Floyd event happened, there, it was kind of an intuitive thing of, you know, maybe this is the trim tab event. Maybe as a country, maybe as a larger, the world, this is going to be so unacceptable. And I feel like kind of reading between the lines uh, of different news accounts and things going on, like, like there is some kind of collective agreement, like no more. You know, I, I don't know if anybody else has a sense, but, Anyway, th that's the feeling I've kind of had, and, and it's a hopeful, you know, it's also a wish. Thank you. Well, I, I think to answer your question, Claire, is that we, we are the ones who have him hanging on the cross still. Uh, you know, it's not, I mean, he went through the resurrection, you know, but we've refused to move on from feeling despair and looking at the illusion and thinking it's real and therefore we can't see reality. And what popped into my head was, um, so, so maybe like if someone has a, a son or a daughter who's a drug addict or an alcoholic <clears throat> and they go through uh, recovery, but you know, the parents never fully trust them it's kind of like, yeah, I know they've gone through, but I don't, I'm, you know, they're still holding on to the image of, of the child as the alcoholic or the drug addict. And so they're not in the present moment. They're not dealing with the real person. They're dealing with this former belief that goes back to the beliefs again. So I think 
That's how I would answer, because it is a bit strange. Like he says, you know, I'm still on the cross 2,000 years ago. Literally, in the sense of that we are putting him up there. And, and look around, like we're talking about. Uh, yeah, we're, in, in our refusal to accept that everybody is a love child of God and that everybody is the divine, the black people and we are all on the cross together because look at the suffering that comes about from that. We're, we're in unconsciousness. Yes. Were you going to say something else, Mariam? I, I agree with that totally. I, I guess I, it's like the unconsciousness for me related to the George Floyd event. I just feel like, I just have a sense the collective is coming to the point of this can't go on. I mean, I feel like this is an important event and I hope a turning point. Yeah. Me too. Any other thoughts? So one of the things I liked was that he said that um, that when he looked down, so you know we can look at that metaphysically. That when when we're not looking high to high consciousness, when we're looking down at the earth and we're just looking at the physical, that it caught him. Like he said, he he wasn't in pain, even in the midst of his own crucifixion he wasn't in pain it was when he looked down and saw his mother and Magdalene and the others mm-hmm. that that's what hooked him and brought brought him down and, and again we can maybe see that happening at the moment that and, and I've talked about this on Sundays that it's we have to be careful it, it's a very delicate walk that while while we walk with people and we open our eyes and we watch it all to be just careful that it doesn't bring us down because it can, you know, and, and then we we're in the quicksand and we're of no help to anybody. So, uh, you know, I, I thought that was a, a very good point about how we get caught with the so-called reality of this world and the suffering. And I know a lot of people do, like the whole question of why people suffer and there, there's no quick answer. And, you know, people give up on God almost because they don't understand how, how can a God be good and how can there be such suffering and pain? You know, again, that drags us down if we get stuck in that thought. Magdalene, I think you're trying to I would like to, um, I do not quite understand that he's felt that he had lost his connection to God because he never did lose his, the Christ never loses his connection to God, but he, he, he realized that, that the people, people are so, un, he said the only sin is our unconsciousness. So he, I guess what made him so desperate is that so many people are un, so unconscious. It's not his, I don't quite understand why he said, he said, God, you have forsaken me. Right. Because well, uh, God never had forsaken him. Right. Well, God never forsakes any of us, but we are the ones who think that God has because our circumstances are so painful. Yes. And, you know, it is recorded, and you know, these are some of the few things that are agreed on, like in the four Gospels, yeah. that he actually said this. And, you know, many people have wanted to erase that. Well, Jesus would never have said that. Well, if he was fully human, yeah. then he, like, he, he would have to have every experience that we can have. Yes, yes, yes. The possibility, at least. And, he, you know, in the midst of that, for whatever reason, whether it was physical pain or whether it was uh, in emotional or mental, watching his mother and all of that, that the yeah. possibility of, of his feeling disconnected happened yes. briefly. Uh, but briefly, very briefly. 
Right, but but there's nothing there's nothing wrong kind of with saying that Jesus had a moment of despair, just as in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, yeah. you know, uh, not my will, but yours. But if you can let this cup pass from me, great. Right. I don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then he does. He but does he does. do it. Yeah. And, and the final thing he says on the cross is, you know, into your hands I commit my spirit. So he, yeah. he had that momentary fall or drop into unconsciousness, and then he reconnects and says, into your hands I commit my spirit. Yeah. So there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that theologically. Uh, scripture yeah. scholars would argue that that's because he was both human and divine. Right. And if he was fully human, that's why he felt that God had forsaken him. Because when you're human, uh, then you can feel that. Uh, right. That's why. And, yeah. and so what, what is our, our man is saying, that we cannot, we do not feel that we are loved by God and we do not have any trust in that. And that is what makes us, what he calls unconscious, you think so? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the not seeing or believing that even despite whatever I'm experiencing, God still loves yes. Like yes. My higher self is still here, like I talked about on Sunday. All right, Patricia, you were going, could you put your hand up? Thanks. Well, I was just going to respond to that uh, the affirmations that we did on Sunday Mm -hmm. uh, I thought were so uh, great because we don't deny the fact that we feel that way, that we feel down, you know, feeling down or like what Jesus (laughs) said, he was feeling sucked into it, but we keep affirming that what the truth is and keep pulling ourselves back, I think is... um, people uh, possibly try to deny the fact that they have negative feelings or that they're afraid and that doesn't really help. It's better to acknowledge it and then still recognize that the truth of your, of your uh, higher self, you know, something to that effect. Yeah. Very much like, you know, what Matt Kahn keeps saying about, you know, whatever arises, love that. It's, the point of power is always be loving towards yourself or the other person, regardless of the feeling that is alive. That if we can stay connected to love, we'll stay connected to the divine because God is love. And, um, you know, that, that's when we lose the sense of presence. Uh, when when we start to get into the mind, because the mind is what's churning up all of the the emotions. Yeah. So <clears throat> I want to um, uh, listening to this about the the um, loss of connection, mm-hmm. um, and why have you forsaken me? So I was thinking of that in terms of okay, if the if the real reality is uh, unity is oneness, then there's a syntactical problem with the statement because <laughs> there is no you. You know, there is only I. There is only the I am presence. So if he's saying, why have you forsaken me? It's actually, why have I forsaken you? Because, and then I started playing with that and, and I thought, okay, if it's about, I lost this connection momentarily here and then I went into this doubt and I saw, oh my God, I didn't, I wasn't the good teacher. I, I, I didn't, what did I do wrong? I didn't get the message there. They, they've all fallen down this rabbit hole. I should have guided them to a point where they wouldn't have done that. You know, they lost the connection as well. So we all lost the connection. And then this metaphor came to me of a door uh, that, you know, sort of the, the knock and it shall be open and all that stuff. And so I was imagining that there's a door between me and God, or between Jesus and the Yeshua and the on the cross and and God, and it 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 felt like he'd closed the door. Or when we close the door, we 
don't feel the connection anymore. We've, we slam the door on God, on the connection with God. And sometimes we even go as far as forgetting that we did that and forgetting that we have the key to, un, uh, to, open, to unlock and open the door again. You know? And so that's what I was kind of imagining, that he'd done that kind of separation and for a moment. And, you know, the flow, is, the flow of, of divine love is not there and all of that stuff. And all of a sudden you're separate. And then, and that's basically what suffering is. Every time that we forget that we're not alone, that we're, you know, not feeling this thing as a separate individual, everything we experience is part of um, the one experiencing life through us. And every time we forget that, then it becomes, you know, a hard road. Right. So, you know, if, if you think about it as a teachable moment, and it has to be the play of humanity's um, interaction with the divine, which would have to um, use the language of you and I, because that's the language of the human story left to itself. You know, you're over there, God, I'm here. And, you know, how do we feel? Well, you, you dropped me in it. You know, you, you did something, and now I'm really feeling bad. And, and so the moment of, on the cross is, ju is just, you know, like watching a Shakespearean play to show us how we do this. Oh, this is where I go. You know, I blame God. You forsook me. <laughs> you know, and, and that's, that's what humanity does. It interprets experience as somehow that God is punishing me. And, um, you know, when I was in the car crash back in 1990, I mean, literally, once the energy entered my body and my body went into this pain, I immediately had this energy move through me is, oh, I never thought this would happen. I must have done something wrong. I mean, it was just like visceral. It just came up out of cells almost. And I literally felt myself fall. It was like a contraction. And that's, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And so what, what we are about on the journey backward, unraveling that is always expanding. You know, the universe is expanding. It's like we're being asked to expand not to contract. Yeah. Great. It, it seems to me like the, the dying pangs of the ego. It's like the last ditch uh, effort to, uh, to separate us or to uh, make us feel separate. And, and it comes right before the awakening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all good. It's all part of the process. And as we watch this now at the moment, we can think what comes next. So let's see what comes next. I have no idea what he's going to share. Uh, it, it, it just occurred to me that that what Greg and Jerry um, um, were talking about, um, it's like the pain and the suffering we were talking about is part of the plan. It's, it's, uh, it's the thing that it's part of the wake up. It's part of the thing. So if we can, so I'm thinking, if I can think of every time that I'm in distress um, or doubt or, um, uh, you know, feeling the victim or any of those sort of things, anytime I'm having any kind of thing that is uncomfortable or painful, I could look at it as, I just fell. I just fell out of unity and went into separation. And that might be, I'm going to try this because <laughs> it, it might be a really uh, faster way to come back into non-separation. To just notice, okay, how did I slam the door? How did I throw away the key and forget that I closed the door? in this moment what what did i do right before i had this experience of pain anyway i'm going to throw that out there and i'm going to I experiment with that myself 
Um, I, actually, I had an experience of it on Sunday when Claire uh, did the Ho'oponopono with us. And so the most painful thing going on in my life right now is a relationship thing. And um, so th that's who I picked to do it with, right? And I had done another one of these exercises where I write the letter that I don't actually intend to send. And then I went back to that and I thought, wow, I reread it. And I said, I don't have any emotional charge on this anymore. I'm going to go ahead and send it. And I did. And he responded right away. And we have been having this amazing conversation for the last several days of just cleaning up a lot of the blockages and the things where the energy is not flowing between us and why he gets scared and why I do and blah, blah, blah. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. See, Claire, told you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, oh, and just one more thing came to my mind. There's a very famous painting uh, of Jesus with a lamp standing at a door. And, you know, that, that's a pretty classic kind of depiction. And, of course, there's no, there's no handle on the door on Jesus' side. Its handle is on the other side of the door. We, we either close or open the door. Okay. Where is my... There was no resurrection. What happened to me next is not known to Christians or anyone else. Christians believe that I surrendered to the death of my physical body and died for their sins. But my crucifixion was not about my physical death. I was not afraid of dying. I was way beyond identification with my physical body. The death of my physical body and the pain and suffering I endured on the cross was not the true sacrifice. It was not the true passion. I was about to become the Lamb of God in a way that few people could possibly realize. Even I did not know what would happen next. My short visit upon the earth had failed. It was such a simple plan. I would walk upon the earth and God's presence within me would be enough to awaken those around me. My teaching would be clear and irresistible for those with ears to hear. But the resistance was too strong. People were so lost that they could not respond. They could not awaken. Even my disciples could not accept that the feeling of God and love and oneness that they experienced in my presence was arising within them and was not coming from me. They projected it all onto me and saw me as the doorway to God. That is not what I intended. I came to reflect to them who they are. I came to reveal to them where God is. If in my presence you feel love, it is because you are love. If in my presence you feel God, it is because God is within you. All that I am, you are. But they could not accept it. They felt unworthy. They were too lost in the mind. That is why the fall on the cross was necessary. Someone would have to journey through the maze that is the world of the human thinking mind in an effort to find the way through. 
many had tried before and had lost their way. Now I would have to embark upon that desperate journey into human unconsciousness. If only I could find the way through, then the way would be revealed for others. It has been a difficult journey since my fall upon the cross, but it was a journey initiated by God in that moment of the fall. Plot thickens. <laughs> so, what what came up for people in this brief section? I, I have a feeling we almost probably should have gone into the next section because he's kind of like left us hanging. <laughs> My reaction was, oh, I'm not sure I got that, and I was hoping you would go to the next section because I think that's when he explains it. Yeah. Any any thoughts coming up for anybody? Comments? Well, there are things that he says that are are um, important, like um, you know, again, just being clear about the fact that the the true passion or sacrifice was not his body, was not the physical part of it. It was the consciousness part of it. And that, as he says, the, the plan sounded simple, you know. Uh, this human being would be so full of love and God, the presence that it would miraculously uh, touch everybody and then everybody would just go along with the, the plan and awaken. But again, it points out like the, the density of unconsciousness and of the resistance to love that he says, you know, they, they could all accept that he was loving and that he was divine, but they couldn't accept it for them. And, you know, historically, <laughs> I mean, you know, you kind of want to say to God, you know, why didn't you come like now? Why did you come back then when you were dealing with people who were so repressed and uneducated? And, you know, because I mean, the whole Jewish religion to claim that you were God was like, you know, that was the worst thing possible. And so you're expecting these poor uneducated people to be able to make that big jump when everything that ever been told was that you, know, you are not the divine. So, I mean, it was a big ask back then. It's still a big ask today. I mean, we can see that in our own selves, but geez, back then it had to be like, just even harder. And then he says that he, he came, you know, to be a mirror to reflect back. And yet there's something in us that we are unable to accept the reflection and that this has to do with us as well. Any thoughts on that aspect of it? Uh, didn't Mary Magdalene uh, get it? And wasn't that kind of the whole purpose of their, uh, of when he appeared to her at the tomb and she went back to tell the other disciples and they just couldn't get it? Didn't she get it? Because she saw him even though he looked different. You know, she saw his true self. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm just saying in terms of the people, the, the larger body, oh, or, yeah. whether it was the Jewish people or the Romans or whoever, Samaritans. I mean, you know, he kind of put it out there that that was, that was the hope, that this is what would happen. Everybody would just wake up and everything would be wonderful in the garden. Of course, you know, Magdalene and the disciples and followers, yeah, they got it, but it was a small group. Um, it, it wasn't the mass conversion, you know, and even today, I mean, if you look at the number of believers, and I'm not talking mm. Christians, but just the number of people who believe in God, it's 
not a majority, you know, there, there's a lot of, still a lot of people don't believe in anything other than just, we're just humans on a rock out in the universe. You know? hmm. Wendy, do you want to hmm. unmute yourself? Uh, sure. So um, the Plato's allegory of the cave comes to mind where we talk about the, um, you know, the, the prisoners of their own reality, right? They can only see what's in front of them. And even when they're brought into the light, they want to go back into the cave because that's what's familiar to them. And, and again, it's, it's just a metaphor for that movement from unconsciousness to conscious awareness. And like you said, I think it is a big ask. Um, and I, like Richard, I was a bit perplexed as well when he said, um, you know, it, it was more about the journey and what he had to go through in order to, um, and I'm waiting for the next chapter to have it revealed, but it, it, it seems to me that this is the human condition, right? And that we're all on this path to discover our true essence, our true self, and to divorce ourselves from what we believe to be the reality in front of us. And, you know, I think people who are on the path struggle mightily, and people who aren't on the path kind of don't want to go there because they see the struggle, right? So yeah. it, it's definitely a paradox and a conundrum um, because, it, it, you know, if all you've experienced is a box and you don't know that the rest of the world can be expansive beyond that box, I think it can feel very frightening. And I think what's going on in the world right now is this consciousness and, and awakening around, you know, what Einstein said, which is you need a different level of consciousness in order to solve the problem than the original, that the original consciousness created, right? right, um, right. And I'm, I'm actually, um, you know, thrilled by that the movement that I'm feeling energetically around what's going on, because I think a lot of people are waking up and it's that, you know, we've reached that tipping point that I think is, is moving people and mass to a level of awareness where they're willing to take on the, you know, the struggle and they're willing to fight for what they believe in. We're willing to fight for what we believe in. Yeah. Uh, so hmm. I mean, to make it really concrete, if you're a white supremacist, and that's your reality. That's the box to use Wendy's uh, analogy. And when you look at black people or people of color, it's like, <laughs> you know, it, you, you just do not relate to them. You don't want to relate to them. You just want them to go back where they came from. And that's the type of leap that we're talking about. You know, if we want to talk about the big ask, the big ask is, can you let go of all of these ideas, all of the indoctrination and uh, all of the propaganda and all of the stuff that you grew up with and see a different reality there and, and understand yourself differently? That's what we're talking about. That's the waking up. Hmm. Richard, Wendy, I, you, I think you just helped take the next step of something I've been thinking the last week. So I've been watching all the the news and the demonstrations and stuff, and and thrilled that there's this awakening going on, and aware that the awakening of a, a lot of what I'm hearing is a political consciousness awakening, and I keep thinking that. You know, and, and the discussion we had in another group about, is this going to be sustainable? Uh, is this going to keep going or is this going to be just another one of those things? Um, and we, you know, the next thing comes along and we forget about this. And my answer to that is, well, unless there's a spiritual consciousness awakening, it will not be sustainable. And I, I kind of had similar thoughts um, in some of the earlier environmental um, movement things that, um, you know, d dealing with ABC, whatever it was, is not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. And, and that 
when it happens at the spiritual level and we actually change our beliefs and our relationship to everything, to the earth and to each other and whatever the issue is, that's when things really shift. Um, or another way of saying it is um, when we talk about there's no political will to get a certain legislation passed and blah, blah, you know, something to be changed. It's the, uh, the, the, the spiritual part is what has to change to create that political will, you know, and most of our culture thinks because we're materialistic, we think it's the other way around. And so I think we have the, the entire, the process and the path we have backwards. Mm -hmm. and, well, and, and the key to that is, it, it's, I mean, it's both, obviously, but the key to it is, I am, we are. Once we understand <clears throat> that there is no separation, that the I am presence is your I am presence, and that what I do to you, I'm doing to the divine. It's so at the heart of it is the spiritual underpinning that we all have our dignity from being the divine presence. And then any movement uh, always refers back to that, always. That's the touchstone. Because if you use any other um, criteria for a movement or change, it, it'll always get bogged down. There'll always be a reason to exclude that group or this group or whatever. The only time that you can't exclude anyone is when you are clear that this is this is me that I'm looking at, mm -hmm. and then you go, oh, okay, then I can't exclude them. I, I must include everybody and the planet. It's all the divine, including animals, even dogs, especially dogs and cats. The and the other. Aha! I had in this one, or not really an aha. It's sort of a glimmer. Um, the when he was talking about the, um, I my plan was to just come and be the presence of oneness and love, and everybody would get it. <laughs> and so, you know, the the closest thing to having a teacher like that was my Tibetan Buddhist teacher, and um, that was a twenty-seven year journey and at it in hindsight or about three quarters of the way through or something I sort of got that the teaching was not what he was coming out of his mouth the teaching was his presence and I, I and I and the, uh, the big aha one of the big aha moments there was one day in class where somebody asked the question that somebody had just asked before and he spent 45 minutes explaining it and she asked the same question again. And all of us old timers, <laughs> all the like senior students, uh, and he kept telling us to not think of ourselves as senior students. I see you all as, as the same, <laughs> whether it's your first day in class or you've been here for 30 years, you're the same to me, right? So that was one of the teachings out of his mouth. And we were not following that teaching that day, very clearly. <laughs> and I saw everybody turn at this woman, and I could feel the darts flying through the air at her. And it was just like the consciousness of us senior students had, had just said to her, where were you? He just explained this. And the lesson, the teaching to, to me at that point was he walked towards her on the, on the, we were in one of those university auditorium things, he walked as close as he could to her and 45 minutes of the, the answer again, you know, to her. And, but giving her, giving it to her one-to-one -one directly. It's like, watch everybody. I'm, I'm teaching you something here about compassion that I am giving this now. Before I gave the answer to the whole crowd of you, now I'm only giving it to her, putting my full attention on this one wonderful student who's asking the question again <laughs> you know there was no judgment there was no nothing and it's just like so ever afterwards i said um any time that somebody did something and i got irritated i would say what would master lynn do and i would think of that episode again that incident and say okay how can i be like that there's my model and and so what i got related to what what 
um, uh, um, Leonard was just saying was I, it, that was three quarters of the years through this. That was like, whatever that is, 15 years or something into studying with him that I got that lesson that it was his presence rather than his words that was the teaching and he was modeling for us. I wasn't ready to get that message. And I, so that's my, my best guess of what was going on there. He said, okay, I, I had this simple plan. It didn't work. Well, it didn't work because we weren't ready for that plan. We weren't ready for that kind of teaching because we had so much. And the other thing that happened was every time at the end of class, he would often offer these various energy work things that would release all the garbage inside of you. And I just kept taking that opportunity every time and I got clearer and clearer and clearer and, you know, less junk inside. And so I think that was part of it. It was just like, it, it, it takes time. So maybe Yeshua needed more than, you know, his three years ministry. He needed a 30 year ministry to prepare people to be able to see the model and the light and the love that he was, was modeling for us. And we just, we, we weren't ready for it. That's, that's my best guess. The, the other part of all this, though, is that, you know, I, I, <clears throat> the divine knew and understood what was going to happen. Jesus as the human divine didn't. And the piece that is so clear to me is that death had to be overcome. The illusion of death had to be overcome. And it's sort of like, whoever came here representing God, if you really thought about it, somehow you were going to have to answer that question. How would you answer the question? You'd have to endure death. Like, you know, you, you could sort of say, well, what if Jesus hadn't been crucified? Well, what would have happened then? You know, how, how would this whole process of crucifixion and resurrection have been implemented and he said in the last thing that he said there at the end of that section was that all of this was initiated by god so he's reminding us that the divine knew what it was up to you know we don't necessarily know what the divine is up to we don't understand why it has to be this way but the divine sees the bigger plan and how it's unfolding in the process Wendy. Just one last comment. It just struck me that, you know, the metaphor of death is not only death to the physical body, but it's death to the belief system that we have. It's death, dying to the old self in order for original consciousness to arise in all of us. So, um, you know, resurrection in the classic sense, right, is about being reborn. Mm. And so I'm curious to know what he says about that. Yes, he wasn't resurrected in the, the, the sense of um, being, uh, well, I guess the classic sense of being some kind of spiritual entity, um, but, but rather I think the message to us is to not only not fear the physical death, but to recognize that it's that transformative aspect of moving from the old, the death to the old self that enables us to let go of that. And to create the, you know, have the faith that God understands this is our journey into um, the reminder of our true essence. Right. Yeah, um, there, there's a famous line, I think it's in the Gospel of Thomas. It says that I was resurrected before I ever came here. And that's, that's a good one to kind of think about. What does that mean? It's like, he, he didn't come here as a human being that, you know, the parentheses, the beginning of life and then the end of life. He was always the divine, infinite, eternal presence. And he knew that. He, that's what resurrection means. You're aware of your infinite, eternal presence. He came here as that. Nothing happened to him. You know, we think, oh, he went, you know, he was this and then he became that. No, he was always that. <laughs> which is the same message for us. Anyway, let's, let's go to the next section and see what he has in store for us.
It is difficult to understand, but in that moment of my fall upon the cross, there was a split in my consciousness. At one dimension of consciousness, I've been nailed onto the cross, enduring the pain and suffering involved in that moment of the fall. I've been held there by your need for me to be crucified for your sins and by your belief in me as your Savior. At another dimension, I've been journeying through human unconsciousness for 2,000 years, lost within the world of the mind, trying to find the way through. I've lived many lifetimes since my death upon the cross. I've experienced all the human emotions and every kind of suffering. I've experienced isolation and despair. I've encountered every form of cruelty and injustice known to man. I've experienced guilt and shame and judgment over and over again. I've experienced the pain of living in a world of separation where no one is truly present. I've experienced the pain of separation from God, which is the true source of all suffering. It seemed as though I was taking the pain and suffering of the whole world upon my shoulders. I was weighed down with the suffering of all humanity. And there was no escape. The realm of the human thinking mind is like an endless labyrinth. It is an intricate web of illusion from which there is no escape. I could not find the way out, no matter how hard I tried. I studied all the religious teachings. I followed all the spiritual paths, but still I could not find my way out. I had no idea who I'd been or why I'd come here. With very little break between lifetimes, I have continued on my way, lost like everyone else, unable to find my way back to God. Okay, um, so I, I think I think the key to this section is to remember that the Christ consciousness is everywhere and in everyone. And if if we if we think about what he just said as if it was pertaining only to Jesus, then I think it gives the wrong. Um, understanding to us. But if we think about it, what he's saying is that the Christ has been embedded in every single human being. And for 2,000 years, he's been trying to find his way out. The Christ in us has been trying to awaken us so that we have a second coming. That, you know, is the traditional term in traditional Christianity. So I'm throwing that out there because I think, otherwise I think we get off on a whole wrong uh, track and we must understand what he just said. But, you know, say, say whatever you want to say. Um, you don't have to agree. Marion? Well, I go back again to George Floyd and I just said to Louis, you know, what if we think of George Floyd as Christ? You know, how are we responding to this event? Um, and I tend to think of things in the collective, you know, because I'm very interested in the shift in consciousness. So it's like, how in consciousness are we all responding? And I feel like there is kind of a recognition amongst more people about this can't go on. This has got to stop. So anyway, that, that was just what came up for me. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and and I'm just, it's, it's almost too, like, if you include the policeman in there, yeah. there's the trying to wake up, and there's George Floyd trying to wake up. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's what I was going to say. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, it's one thing to relate yourself to George Floyd, but it's another thing to relate yourself to that cop that killed him. Yeah. Because um, that's the key, is that we have to identify or realize that we are Trump, we're, uh, we're all of those things, and that that's how we're going to change is by realizing that we're one rather than being against, you know, taking sides on everything. Mm -hmm. and that's a tough nut to crack, I tell you. Right. And, and he started by saying that uh, there's been a split in his consciousness. Yeah. Well, there, there it is right in front of us. I, mm -hmm. I'm a victim. I'm black and poor. I need to make counterfeit money or I need to do whatever things he's done. You know, we know he's had a criminal background, whatever. And then on the other side is the self-righteous uh, oppressor or, you know, whatever the policeman's consciousness represents for each one of us. Magdalene. Yes, I would like to, I was really shocked when he said that he has reincarnated many, many times. I mean, the man Jesus, everybody reincarnates many, many times, but the Christ Jesus and the Christ is not the same thing. And so I was kind of shocked when he said that he has been living many, many times because Christ has been, the Christ has been overcome death. And so Christ cannot reincarnate again, but maybe the man Jesus can. So it was completely new to me to think of that though. Well, I, I was suggesting, though, Magdalena, that's the other way around. It, huh? it, it's not Jesus. It's not Jesus who reincarnates. It is the Christ. Thanks. We are all the Christ. The Christ is always the life that is being reinvented. The divine is always the life that is showing up generation after generation. Yes, and also, I mean, it comes when, when you see the beginning of the Gospel of St. John, when he says, you know, everything is in the world has been uh, created by the Logos and by the, the, the so we actually has always been there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that I, I, that makes sense to me. But that he reincarnates again, that, that is, seems to me, I cannot, I well, cannot. I, I think it's the use of the word reincarnation. We we understand that in a certain way, especially yeah. from the East. And usually what that suggests is that it's me, Jerry, and that yeah. I have either lived before as Jerry or I'm going to come back as a fly or a cat or a dog or another human no, being. No, no, not, not as a cat, but as another human being. Hopefully not as a cat. I'll, I'll accept the dog. That's for sure. No, I do not accept the dog either. <laughs> Has to be another human being. Well, if you, if you saw our dog's life, you would happily come back as a dog <laughs> who has two men who adore him. You know, anyway, we we'll won't get into that. But so I, I think the reincarnation bit is it's the divine it's coming crazy. back. It's the divine always coming back, not yeah. my personality, not me, Jerry. Yeah, I see. Okay. That's, that, that's, I don't know. Greg, will you go to jump back in again? No? Okay. Anybody else? Any thoughts on this? I want to say you? something, Jerry. Yeah, too. Um. <clears throat> the word for me that has been so powerful from ever since I joined Unity is my awareness of my separation. I have struggled with that separation thing forever. And what Marion and Greg and, and Richard, all of you have been talking about, uh, and just recently, this whole image of I've always heard how hard I am on myself. And so when Marion and Richard, or, or um, Patricia Plank, 
I can't think of your name. I'm sorry. Anyway, when I thought when I thought of of um, me being the policeman and my real self being on the ground, I see that. And I see how I have crucified myself. And there is something I spent some time trying to find in Way of Mastery. We just read it, oh, maybe a few weeks ago about how many times are you going to keep crucifying yourself? Mm -hmm. And and I, I know that one real well. Mm -hmm. And I'm real tired of it. And it's, it's, it's time to let that sucker go. Mm -hmm. Really. And, and it is the crucifixion of the big self. You know, we, we, we look at Jesus and we think, oh, humanity crucified Jesus. But what he was trying to say to us is humanity is crucifying its divinity yes. by not accepting yes. it, by yes. rejecting it. Yes. And so, you know, we, we, again, it's like we, we easily go there like that, oh, I'm crucifying Jerry or I'm crucifying Sydney, you know, or whoever, yeah. but it's like, oh, no, it's deeper than that. This is me, the divine, using my creative power, misusing my creative power. Yes, yes. By my yes. higher self in yes. another human being or even in myself. And you could say denying, you know, yeah. that's, that's crucifying. Or yeah. it's like I said on Sunday, invalidating. Maybe I didn't say that Sunday. <laughs> that's another talk I'm working on. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Were you just talking about uh, creating through the ego instead of the divine self? Yeah. The the like in the way of mastery, it talks about that we can either well, it yeah. says yeah. make we can make a creation, or we can um, you know allow the divine to create through us. And so often the ego attempts to kill the divine. That's our, our, what we make from the ego. Instead of allowing the divine to create the unity of the ego and divine selves. Yeah. So, so is that another aspect of what we mean by crucifixion? When you're trying to make things out of ego instead of let the divine flow through you and not have an agenda. Right. Yeah. The crucifixion yeah. Is, is just a metaphor for the process by which we separate ourselves out or we feel ourselves in, that we've lo we're lost, um, that, that we've fallen and, and that there's two of, two of us here. And like I said on Sunday and that we're, that the higher self is something that is this, you know, um, marathon that we're on to finish in order to get there instead of accepting this is my higher self right now, this morning you know, with you guys hmm. yeah. alright um, moving on to the next section this lifetime the way of liberation has been revealed to me. I am restored to truth, love and oneness. I am restored to my true home which is the present moment. I am restored to God. The Savior has been saved. The fallen Jesus is resurrected. I did not die for your sins. I fell for your sin of unconsciousness, which is the only sin. Is that not a much greater sacrifice than dying for your sins? I truly was the Lamb of God. I came as the Son of God, but now 
I come as the Son of Man, and my message has not changed. When you awaken fully into presence and the realization of oneness with God, you are a Christ, which simply means that you are awake in oneness with God. You are the Savior, but only of yourself. You have saved yourself and you have saved your soul. By liberating yourself from the past and future world of the mind into the world of now. You have delivered your soul into its own immortality. That makes you a part of the second coming of Christ. And it matters not whether you are a Christian, a Buddhist, a Jew or a Muslim. In truth, we are all one and there is only one God. The conflict that we experience with each other exists only because we are lost in the illusion of separation. It is time for every Christian to become a Christ. And what I am sharing is not just for Christians. I was not a Christian. I was a Jew. I never considered myself to be anything other than a Jew. My mother was Jewish. My disciples were Jewish. Everything that occurred in my life was according to Jewish law and Jewish prophecy. I came to deliver a message for the Jews. I came to help them fulfill their sacred covenant with God because they were lost. It is important that Christians recognize and honor their Jewish origins. To understand what it means to be Jewish, you have to go all the way back to the covenant with Abraham. The covenant is simply this. Enter into right relationship with me, says God, and I will deliver you unto the promised land. That's it. That's all you need to know about what it means to be Jewish. The problem is that God did not reveal to Abraham some very important details, like what is the promised land? Where is the promised land? How do we get there? How do we recognize it when we arrive there? And what is right relationship with God? Perhaps Abraham should have insisted on answers to these questions. For without answers to these questions, it has been difficult for Jews to fulfill their covenant with God. But let's roll the clock back. Let's go back in time. Let's give Abraham an opportunity to ask these questions of God. For God's answers will provide clarity and guidance not only for Jews, but also for Christians and Muslims and anyone else seeking to awaken. How can I roll the clock back, you might ask? How can I go all the way back to Abraham? Well, let me say once again, before Abraham was, I am. I, I loved the section when I heard it for the first time. Um, he, he simplifies the whole uh, Jewish religion to uh, having right relationship with God. Uh, and I will give you the promised land. And of course, the promised land is now. Now, the now that Jesus talks about as the kingdom or queendom of God. And that when he says that our true home is eternally in the now moment in the presence of God. And it's like, wow, that is so simple. And as he says, it doesn't matter whether you're Jewish, Hindu, you know, Muslim, Christian. It's like that's the common spiritual path and practice is to be the right relationship is to be in the present moment knowing that 
This is the divine talking, looking, seeing, hearing. And what I'm seeing is the divine. And, uh, and when we all awaken to that, then we have the second coming of Christ. All right, over to you guys. Yeah, it seems like uh, the kingdom of heaven, you know, is uh, was Jesus's version of the promised land. And he said it much more clearly than Abraham got it as the uh, promised land they took as a geographical area. And uh, we don't take the kingdom of heaven as within. I mean, it says it right there. Why we don't, I don't know. I mean, it's as clear as uh, anything that uh, that's where it is, the present moment, the kingdom of heaven. And I think that's what Jesus has figured probably that or that that would be enough, but apparently it wasn't. <laughs> well, it, it seems that we have this ability to invalidate our experience that you know jesus says like now is the kingdom now is heaven on earth and we go and we look and we go no i don't think so you know you are the light of the world uh no i don't think so because you know i i had that thought five minutes ago about killing someone how could i be the light of the world you know and on and on and on we just invalidate ourselves the whole time that, that it's always something else, something more, something higher, some someplace else, but it's never completely good enough as it is right now. Well, it might be because for centuries people have been told they were sinners and, you know, were the scum of the earth. <laughs> you know, it's taken us a long time to, you know, and many people haven't even heard these ideas, so it's, it's a long road. Unfortunately, yes. Magdalena. Yes, and, um, but also he said, the kingdom of God is within you. I mean, that is so amazing, you know, to, to realize the kingdom of God is in the present moment, and it's in me, it is not out there somewhere. And that is such a such a profound thought. So how would you how would you say then that it is within you though? You know, it, again, it's easy to say, "Oh, the kingdom of God is within me." How do you experience that? What does it feel like? Well, the only the way that I can experience is that I am so confident that the Christ is within is with me all the time. And I never can forget that I'm loved and, and I'm, I, am, I have this very strong feeling that, it is, the, that the Christ is within me. And I must not forget that. All right. So I'm, I'm really going to play devil's advocate with you. How? Tell me how the Christ, what is this Christ? Is there some little man inside you? No. So how would you explain to someone there at Eschaton? What does that mean to say that the Christ is in you? Yeah, that's a good, that is a good question. Well, I, <laughs> Jerry's kind of prompting me, or I'm getting a prompt inside. I experienced the kingdom of God yesterday. Oh. Within. Mm -hmm. um, I had just, finished a, the live Jetamali meditation and I was in a dream state that coming out of the meditation, not quite awake, not, not necessarily very aware. And I had an experience, uh, a, a unity experience, a oneness experience where I felt the very being of I am lift out of my chest. I, I remember thinking, is my body lifting? Because I felt like I was going like this, you know. But it wasn't. It was just my spirit was lifted 
I guess out of my body, I, I, had no, I, I had no sense of body, but just experienced this incredible love and joy and bliss. Um, and I think that happened two, maybe three times where I kind of came back into where I felt I was in my body and then out again. And I'm still processing it. It was not, you know, it certainly wasn't anything that I did, but I think that Christ within me, I, I was exploring within rather than being focused outside. I wasn't thinking, you know, I don't know, I, it, but it was just an amazing experience. And thinking about it in these terms, it was like I had been lifted into the kingdom of God that's always there, always within me, but um, usually not aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know, I'm, I'm just going to use this. Thank you for sharing that, by the way. Um, so the, the 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 way then that we sort of translate that experience is to say that I had to go somewhere. You know, it's almost like the old paradigm. It's like, oh, I had to go outside my body in order to experience my divinity. But that's really not true. It's what, uh, maybe what's truer to say is that the Christ consciousness is expanded consciousness. It cannot be contained within the body. It is within the body, but it is more than just being in the body. And so I think the part about where we feel like we left our bodies, and I'm only relating this back to my own experience many years ago, is it is expanded consciousness. And, and when you hit that note, you, you, you go beyond the body. But it's so important for us to remember that you, you're still that Christ presence that is partially being experienced as you within the body, but it is a much bigger consciousness. That's a beautiful way to say it, Jerry, because I didn't have this sense like I was up at the ceiling looking down at my body. There was not that sense of being out of body, but there was just clearly this sensation of being lifted. And maybe that was just the expansion. That's the expansion. what I was experiencing. It's just this incredible expansion that went beyond my body. Yeah. And I mean, it was, it was quite startling, but wonderful. There was nothing scary about it. And I, I said to Jay, I wonder if that's what it feels like when you die. Mm -hmm. I thought this, you know, expansion of, of your awareness and consciousness. So. Yeah, to be in the body. You know, Paul talks about that right now I'm experiencing the kingdom in the body and that I'm looking forward to the day when I won't be restrained by this corporal physicality when it will, you know, I, I will experience my consciousness as that of the universe and I'll feel the expansion to being the universe. Marian? Well, I feel like we have glimpses of that. Like, mm -hmm. like there are moments like looking at a beautiful sunset. We've had beautiful sunsets recently, you know, and this feeling of expansion and just, it is a feeling of oneness and expansion or holding a newborn baby that there are moments I feel like when we have glimpses of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, again, it's sort of like we have to just remind ourselves that, that, and what I was trying to tease out of Magdalena earlier was of course, the idea of consciousness. Like what is in me that is in everybody else that is fully in Christ? And it, it's consciousness, it's awareness. Uh, that's that's what we're talking about. That's what the divine is. And that's been, as Jacobson says, for 2,000 years, it's been experiencing itself, trying to liberate itself from the same ideas and the same experiences uh, of all the people who rejected Jesus. We're, we're all playing out the same story in our humanity. That's that's, you know, in metaphysics and when we look at scripture, that's what we always say. Jesus is just, we're watching a play and this happened to him and I'm going through the exact same thing. 
and the public is attacking him. There's a part of me that's at war with myself that's saying, no, you're not the divine. And I'm going to nail you to the cross for us if you keep saying this until you finally give up. Wendy. You know, in thinking about this, I, I was resonating with what Claire was saying about this expansiveness, but I also had an experience yesterday where I was walking and uh, I have a particularly favorite spot that I, that I go. And my intention was just to be fully present in that moment in my body um, and to let go of all of the concerns and the thoughts I've had about, you know, how can I be more actively engaged in what's going on and where can I donate money and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I just decided I'm just going to walk. I'm just going to walk and I'm just going to be aware of what's happening here. And I, I got to this space where I, I went to, um, I went down the path that I don't normally go on. And it was like the, just seeing the light in the trees, just feeling the breeze on my body, just feeling my feet on the ground, feeling really comfortable in my body, feeling the breath coming in, the breath going out. And it wasn't transcendent. It wasn't, it was just so lovely. And for me, that was the gift in that moment was to be able to feel my own presence and my own breathing and this, this feeling that I had of being connected to the trees and the grass and the, listening to the, the creek burbling and, and to just be able to take five minutes and just be in that space without any thought or plan or past reflection or you know worrying about my mom or you know any of the other things that kind of came to me that felt so peaceful and in that moment i felt like this is what it is for me it's just being where i am how i am what i am in this space and finding just joy in the simplicity of that moment mm -hmm. What, what a perfect note to end on, because that's exactly what, what he's been talking about in these last few sections, that it is, okay, Kathy, I'll get to you, that um, there's this incredible poem by an English poet who talks about the shook shining and the dappled, whatever, mm -hmm. and it's this incredible description of just nature and the present moment like you just described for us and and that's the right relationship with the promised land mm -hmm. like can you just be so much connected to everything and, um I, I remember one day I, I used to go to this beach down by diamond head well on the grass actually and i was practicing uh, a meditation and i was doing it for quite a few weeks and I was just listening. It's like you're just kind of listening and you're connecting. And all of a sudden, my hearing, like, it just went up by about mm -hmm. 10 notches. And I could hear way over at the other side of the park. I could hear everything. And, and mm -hmm. it's like I, I was just thrown by it. And then it, then it went back down. Mm -hmm. But it showed me, like, when you are so present, it's as if, the quality of of the moment just opens up to you so that you're you're experiencing the grass and the birds and the trees and the air and everything or like you yesterday or, or the same thing it's like it just expands and you're able to feel into the depth of the present moment which is the promised land we've arrived kathy lee you've got the last oops <laughs> i think i muted you sorry um, can you unmute yourself? Unmuted. There you go. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, um, yes, this has been quite um, an interesting journey this morning. And I just want to invite the women of Unity to have another beautiful present moment tomorrow at 1030 at Wolf Creek where the nature is so gorgeous, it's hard not to be present. So Wendy and others 
that like that experience, please come and join with us. And so you're gathering over by the little park there at the end of... <laughs> Yeah, it's actually Allison Ranch Road and Freeman Lane, Wolf Creek Trail. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is always so good. Thank you all for being here. Uh, mm -hmm. Love you all. Have a bright, shiny day in the promised land. <laughs> Thank you. Not, not what we experience maybe next week in the promised land. All right. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.